from New York. No, we are in Laguna Woods, and it's the Laguna Woods Show with your host and moderator, Esther Grossfield. Here's Esther. Hi, welcome to Laguna Woods Show, where every guest met us. Today we have a very special guest. She's the director of OC Normal, and her name is Candice Haas. <laughs> Hi, Candice. Hi there. So nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me on today. How did you end up involved in the cannabis industry? Well, actually, it's been 15 years now, and I first started uh, when I was a student, and I actually lost my financial aid due to a possession charge. In this country, unfortunately, you are, are not able to get financial aid if you have any kind of drug possession charge. If you are a murderer or a rapist, they still give you money to go to school, but unfortunately, if you have any kind of cannabis possession, even paraphernalia, they take those funds away from you. So when this happened to me, um, it really put, took my life off track. I had to stop going to school, get a full-time job. It took me a couple years to go back to school. But I really felt like the injustice had been done, and this really wasn't fair. So I went online, researched organizations, and I found an organization called Normal, and I started working with them. So, so you, uh, you, you, what year did Normal start? Um, well, I started my chapter in 2003, but National Normal started in um, 1970, so they're almost 50 years old. Wow. Yeah. So, so how many members are there? Um, National Normal, which stands for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, N-O-R-M-L. Yeah. Um, they have over 100,000 members throughout the country. They have over 100 different chapters, and they also have chapters in other countries as well that work on marijuana reform. We have a national chapter that's based in Washington, D.C. that does federal legislation work. We have a California chapter that works with our legislator here in um, Sacramento. And then the local chapters work on more of a county or, or district basis working on reforming laws. Wow. So, so what would you say to people who oppose cannabis? Yeah. Well, you know, cannabis isn't for everybody, first of all, I always tell everybody. But just like we don't condone people that, that choose to smoke or choose to drink, as long as people aren't hurting others with their choices, as long as they're being responsible users, I think that, you know, now in this day and age, you know, that people should give those who choose to use cannabis, you know, a, a break. And, and, you know, a lot of science has been coming out to show the healthful benefits of cannabis. Um, it's been, it's great for people that have medical conditions and also for people that, after a long day's work, you know, they like to come, some people come home and have a glass of wine. Some people like to come home and enjoy marijuana. So, you know, nowadays it's, it really doesn't make any sense to criminally punish or to um, look down and discriminate against people who use marijuana as long as they're doing it in a responsible way. So, so uh, who should use cannabis? Well, definitely people that are of age. Um, in California here, you have to be 21 years or older to use cannabis. And if you're a medical patient, 18 years old, um, we at Normal always um, advocate for it to be an adult use drug. You know, we want to make sure that people are done developing. Um, but marijuana is good for people that suffer from a lot of medical conditions. Um, two, a couple of the biggest conditions that we see people using cannabis for are those with pain conditions who are taking a large amount of prescription drugs. Um, also people that suffer from insomnia and who have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep and who want to avoid those strong prescription drugs as well. And then also we see a lot of people nowadays using it for gastrointestinal problems, people with digestive issues really? and upset stomachs and that kind of thing. Wow. And then I would say the fourth category is people with anxiety, depression, and PTSD have found a lot of relief for cannabis as well. Wow. So uh, you have... Uh meetings yeah yeah what kind of meetings are yeah there? our chapter of normal in orange county has two meetings actually yes. we meet on the second wednesday of the month um in santa Ana, and that meeting is a general meeting where we really give people legislative updates like what's happening at the state level what cities are looking at regulating marijuana and then we also have special guest speakers that are more geared towards consumers and advocates and and just people who want to learn about cannabis and then we have a second meeting on the fourth Wednesday of the month, also in Santa Ana. And this meeting is an industry meeting. So it's more geared towards people who want to open a business, who want to invest in cannabis, who want to just learn about more business aspects. So we have 
you know, people talk about taxes and employees and laws and regulations and stuff at that meeting. And then all of our meetings are free and they're open to the public. Um, so anyone can come and just get educated. So do you like uh, save people from jail? Do you take people out from jail that has been there for many years? Well, because you know, there's, the there's actually people who are serving de facto life sentences for marijuana, not yeah. from California, but in other states with yeah. very harsh marijuana laws or even federal sentences. So we don't actually participate in their court sentences and help them, but we do send them cards every month to let them know that, you know, we are thinking about them from the inside. We are trying to change laws to free wow. these people. But then on a more local level, if people have legitimate cases and if they're going to court we will give them court support so when they're in front of a jury with trial we'll pack that whole courtroom with people who support them and we'll have like little lapels on them with like a little red cross and green leaf and so that really affects the jurors when they look out into the courtroom and they see a whole audience of people in wheelchairs and you know mature people adults um respectable looking people they're like you know that does help weigh into the decision like maybe this person isn't you know a drug dealer but maybe they were providing this for a medical reason so in those two ways we help people serving census for marijuana wow so uh what are some of the issues that that you're working on now well we've been around for 15 years so the issues have definitely changed over the years about 15 years ago you know there was no dispensaries at all so we were trying to work towards that and then we had this period of time where we did have dispensaries but they were operating illegally and there would be a lot of raids so we'd be like there you know with signs and protesting and taking videotape footage um, and then there was a period of time when a lot of people, patients were even getting arrested and we would do a lot of court support. Oh, yeah. But now, 15 years later, we have regulations. And so our, our duty has kind of switched to educating people about these regulations so they can follow the laws and do things correctly. So we've been doing a lot of education about these new regulations that came out from the um, state, from the Bureau of Cannabis Control, which is part of the consumer um, advocacy organization of the state. We've been really educating people on those because there's 315 pages of laws. So there's wow. a lot to inform people about. Wow. So tell us uh, about the voter initiative of, uh, of OC Normal. Uh, that, uh, that is in uh, yeah. Santana. So in 2012, when the state actually had protections for dispensaries, but we didn't have any in Santa Ana, there was a lot of operators that were uh, kind of operating in the gray area illegally. And the city would go around and arrest people, then they'd open the next day. Then they'd arrest people, then they'd open the next day. And it really wasn't getting anywhere. And we were asking the city in Santa Ana to regulate and to license and to tax these dispensaries. Well, they thought at the time that it was too politically controversial for them, so they didn't want to take that movement. So Orange County Normal started a political action committee um, called the Committee to Support Medical Marijuana Ballot Initiative. We raised over $250,000 from the dispensaries that were operating and wanted to operate legally. We gathered 13,000 signatures and we got it on the ballot in Santa Ana. Um, wow. All of a sudden, when it qualifies for the ballot, the city's like, well, I think we're, we're gonna support this now. So they actually put a measure against ours that was a little bit more conservative, uh, allowed a couple less dispensaries and the tax rate was higher. Um, so that went before the voters in November 2012. Um, turned out after the election and keep in mind this is Santa Ana so it's a highly Hispanic predominantly conservative community um, and it was an off-year election so it wasn't even a presidential election where you see a lot of young people voting but our initiative got 54 percent and the city's got 60 percent so under the state constitution the city's initiative was the one that got implemented and so that's what we have now Santa Ana is the only city in all of Orange County where you can actually buy legal retail marijuana and it's all due to Orange County Normals work. So that's one of the wow. biggest things that we've done. Unbelievable. Wow. So uh, what are the new regulations? Yeah. So the new regulations um, are to license and to control and to collect taxes from all the marijuana businesses that are involved in commercial cannabis use. They were first written to only regulate medical marijuana because that's all that had passed due to our Proposition 215 that passed in 1996. And then when Proposition 64 passed in 2016, they rolled that into the regulations as well. So originally there was two different categories, licenses for adult use companies and regulations for medical marijuana companies. Um, now just recently they merged those so you can actually get a license for both if you plan to do both. 
Um, so there's five different main license types. There's um, a retail license, like the dispensaries in Santa Ana. There's retail non-storefront, like a delivery. There's cultivation licenses for those that choose to grow. And they have both indoor and outdoor licenses. And they have manufacturing, like people who take the cannabis and make it into candy bars or oils. They have a distribution because a new um, part of this industry is that people who make the product can't bring it straight to the dispensary anymore. It has mm -hmm. to go through a distribution level, sort of like alcohol. Yes, yes. So the distribution license is very interesting because they're the ones who are, are the quality control. They make sure that it's all tested up to state standards, that it's labeled correctly, and they also collect a tax at that level. And then the last category is a micro business, which combines three different licenses in one business. Because like I said, if you grow cannabis, like say you have a large facility, like nice. a big, big building, and you have a store in the front and you have a cultivation center in the back, you can't bring your own marijuana you grew from the back to the front unless you have a distribution license. Wow. So this micro business is set up for that kind of entity so that you can bring your own product from one side of the house to the other and again, the distribution has to make sure that it's labeled correctly, tested, and they collect a portion of the taxes there. So those are the main category types. And there's even subcategories within that as well. And they have a license for people to check for mold and all this. Oh, that's true. There's a testing license as well. Yeah, so really six types of licenses. Wow. So what does it take for somebody to open up a dispensary? Well, to open a dispensary, first of all, you have to be in a city that legally allows it. Okay. So here in Orange County, for instance, Santa Ana is the only city that allows retail licenses. The city of Costa Mesa allows for manufacturing, distribution, and testing. And the city of Santa Ana is soon to enforce or to allow manufacturing, distribution, and testing. And the city of Irvine also allows for testing. So you have to be in one of those cities. Now, within those cities, when you apply it, you have to first have a building that's in a certain area. Most cities have corn to area that they want the dispensaries or marijuana businesses to be in. Most of the time, it's an industrial area. They have to, by state law, be 600 feet away from a sensitive use area, like a school or a park or any kind of playground yes, yes, where yes. children are. Yes. So you have to be you know, in the right city, in the right location. And then in some cities, there's also a fee for the How license. Much? In the this, city of Costa Mesa, it's about $55,000 to apply for a marijuana business license. Santa Ana, they have different fees for different kinds of licenses, but it's about ten, fifteen thousand dollars for a license in Santa Ana. So it's kind of it's quite costly. And then besides that, you know, you have to have money set up for you know your bonds, your insurance, your you know all your equipment that you need set up, the rent. And in the city of Costa Mesa, some of these businesses that have license have been waiting a year for the city to give them the okay. Oh, so you really, really have to yeah. have quite a bit of money for investment to just ride the wave until you're given the go-ahead to do so. Like all together, it could be like a hundred thousand or It something. could actually be like a million dollars. A million yeah. dollars? Yeah, that's what we've had some of our speakers come and say at the normal meetings, you know, that if you have one or two hundred thousand dollars, that may not be enough. It may be an even bigger investment than that. But if you think about it, this is a chance to get in on the ground floor of a completely new industry and create generational wealth. And there's a big risk associated with that. I mean, it is unfortunate because there's a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time, you know, that since the medical marijuana passed and they should have a shot at it. Um, so hopefully they're able to like work with other companies or find investors so that they can get a license. But just like starting any business in California, it's quite expensive. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be cheaper, no? Yeah. It used to be much cheaper. And nothing's cheap anymore now these days. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so how do the taxes add up for legal yeah. cannabis? Yeah, so that's something that's really affected the industry, and especially patients on a low income and seniors. Um, the tax that's collected at the distribution level that I talked about is 15%. So that tax is actually passed along. So when the product arrives at the dispensary, we already incorporate that 15% into the price of the product. Now, when you uh, make your purchase at the register, there's also state and sales tax, state and local sales tax. So that's about you know seven to nine percent, depending on like what locality you're in. And then the city can also impose their own marijuana tax. So in the city of Santa Ana, if it's a medical purchase, there's a six percent tax, and if you're recreational, it's an eight percent tax. So all in all, it's about thirty percent. Oh wow! Yeah, I did not uh, different. The yeah, there's different tax schemes for the different type. And then also, if you are a medical marijuana patient, 
and if you have a recommendation from a doctor and then you bring that to the county you can get an id card from the county and then with the id card you can ex be exempt from the state and local sales tax so you could save like seven to nine percent if you take that extra step but to tell you the truth not very many people have that id card why yeah. maybe it's because you have to bring your <laughs> so medical much. documentation to the yeah. county yes, you yes, know yes, and yes, file yes, it with yes, them yes, a lot yes, of people yes. you know just don't don't, don't, that, don't really trust the government yet they'd rather not be on a list <laughs> a, anonymous you know but then again some people you know don't want really to save money yeah <laughs> they're more worried about the money <laughs> so is there any state legislation in process that might affect the cannabis industry yeah definitely this year they introduced over 60 bills so our chapter of normal went to sacramento and we spoke to our legislators about these bills um, there's one bill where they want to allow parents to come to school to administer cbd products to children who are seriously ill so if a child has epilepsy or some kind of cancer and they need it to be able to function throughout the school day they want to allow parents to come and administer cannabis to them on on premises which is revolutionary you know yeah. um, there's also many laws to to tweak the regulations that are in front of us now um, to allow different license types to do different things we at one time had a bill that would have lowered the tax the 15 percent to something more reasonable like 10 percent um, but that didn't make it there's also a bill that would give uh, employment protection. So if someone is a medical marijuana patient, we want to make it so that people can't be fired for using their cannabis at nighttime, on the weekends, when they're not working. Because that happens a lot still to this day. You yeah. know, people if that are... test them. If they yeah. test them. Yeah, employers so testing test people. Them yeah. Anymore. So if this bill passes, then as long as you're using it, you know, off, outside of work time and you have a medical marijuana recommendation, then you would be able to, you know, still use still your work. cannabis and keep your job. Um, there's also another type of license I forgot to mention, which is a cannabis events license. So what if you want to have any kind of event where cannabis is consumed or sold, you have to have a license. And right now the law says that it can only, events can only be held at county fairgrounds, like the Orange County Fair oh, wow. or agricultural associations. Mm -hmm. But here in Orange County, you know, we only have one fairground and they've said no. They don't want any cannabis events. So that pretty much means that there can't be any kind of farmers markets or, you know, consumption events. But this new law that's um, in front of the legislators would allow cannabis events to be held out other places as long as the city, county um, jurisdiction gave them permission to do so. So there's many, many laws that are still in front of our legislators that would, you know, kind of help iron out some of these issues. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. And the legislative session ends in September, so this is these are all going to be resolved fairly quickly. On July 1st, there were some changes. To, uh, yeah. <laughs> how did that affect you? Yeah, well, it affected a lot of patients and a lot of people in the industry. Um, they had to change everything. Yeah, so there was a transition period that the Bureau of Cannabis Control set from January 1st until June 30th. And this was a time for the cannabis products that were already out there in the market to be sold. Um, they were already tested to some standards, but July 1st, they had a whole new tier of tests that had to be performed. And also, all the products as July 1st have to be packaged. Um, childproof, opaque pack packaging, resealable. So anything that what didn't meet the testing or the packaging standards had to be sold or else destroyed by June 30th. So you saw a lot of dispensaries that had a lot of inventory. Um, they had to sell it or they had to destroy it. I know there's a lot of dispensaries that had to sell or you know destroy tens of thousands of dollars worth of product. And then come July 1st, a lot of their shelves are bare. So that's kind of what we're seeing in the industry now is we're waiting for companies to get up to speed and to get their packaging up to par and to get all the testing done. So, you know, a lot of people got a lot of deals in June. So hopefully they were able to stock up because now we're kind of seeing the industry kind of creep slowly back up to the level they were before. And this is going to happen again in December. In December, the full gamut really? of testing has to be implemented. Really? So we may see something like this unless the industry has learned from this and instead of just testing for July standards, they're already testing for December standards so they don't have to have their product destroyed. So what about the THC? Is it like a limit to how much THC somebody can purchase? Yeah, so not or in cannabis flower. And in cannabis flower, you'll usually find about 26% is like a really high THC. Um, but for cannabis edibles, this, the Bureau has said that each edible cannabis product can only have 100 milligrams per package. 
and each uh, cannabis edible has to be in a delineated 10 milligram dosage. So if you buy a candy bar, it's going to be perforated in like 10 a chocolate parts. chocolate or something. Yeah. So okay. that when you're looking at it, you know, okay, this is 10 milligrams. So if I want to take 2.5 milligrams, which is a good starting dose for like a senior yeah. or someone that doesn't have a, a tolerance for cannabis, they'll be able to easily dose themselves. The Bureau wanted to make sure that, you know, especially with this new adult use market, you know, people aren't very, you know, uh, where they maybe have not used cannabis, they're trying it for the first time. So they want to make sure that people, you aren't taking too much and aren't, you know, feeling tired or getting too hungry or, you know, with seniors having falls and stuff. So yeah, the, the maximum milligrams for edibles now is 100 milligrams. Before, uh, before July 1st and, you know, previous years, we'd see some edibles were, that were 1,000 milligrams, which wow. sounds really high for most people. But some people choose to use cannabis edibles instead of taking pain pills, or they may have been using cannabis to treat these conditions for 20 years, so they have a really high tolerance. Um, and then also just to save money, you know, if you can get 1,000 milligram cookie and then cut it up, you know, like a pizza and then mini slices, you can make that one product last a long time. Now, if you needed, say, 500 milligrams a day, you're going to have to eat five, mil five candy bars, you know? And the price has changed. Candy bars used to be maybe $15. Now out the door, some cannabis candy bars are like twenty eight dollars. So wow, you know, so it really has impacted out. patients, but they're doing it to err on the safety side, so that people that are new to cannabis don't have bad experiences. Wow, that's really something. Yeah. So, so what kind of products does the cannabis have? Yeah. So you can find There's cannabis. So many yeah, in many different forms. There's edible cannabis, you know, which it takes a long time to set in. It can take like an hour before you start feeling it, but it can last eight hours. There's smoked cannabis or vaporized cannabis um, that you inhale. There's also sublingual cannabis, which is drops that you can put underneath your tongue and you let it absorb into your mouth. Yeah. And that's nice because that's sort of in the middle. It takes about 30 minutes to set in and it lasts like two to three hours. So it's like nice and in the middle. And then there's also cannabis topicals like lotions and creams and oils and also patches. And what's nice about these products is that if they're if cannabis is used topically, there's no psychoactivity. So you Just won't even C B D. Yeah, C B D is non psychoactive, but then also THC used externally is non psychoactive. Really? So it will help with inflammation and with skin conditions, but it won't it's not able to penetrate your skin and to get into your blood system at the levels that would actually make you feel different in your head. So a lot of seniors are erring towards these topicals because yes. you know, they can help with their swelling and their joints, but you know, wow you don't feel any different. You so can do what you want to do. Really? THC yeah. Topicals. You don't feel anything? As long as it's used just topically. As soon as you ingest THC, then you do get psychoactivity. Wow. But like you mentioned before, CBD is sort of a new thing in the last five years. And CBD is nice because even if you use a, a CBD edible or a CBD sublingual, like a drop, those don't have any psychoactivity as long as the THC limit level is very low. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> there's so much there's to learn and to people, know about cannabis. There's a lot of people suffer from inflammation oh yeah you know inflammation is the root cause of a lot of conditions yes, not just yes. like joints and swelling yes. but you know inflammation in your intestinal tract inflammation you know all over the body causes pain and conditions so if you can treat the inflammation you can treat the underlying condition without having to take prescription medicine we know there's a lot of people and a lot of seniors that so are lot seniors taking a that... lot of prescriptions you know and it's it's good to try you know there's holistic things there's exercise diet and then now a lot of people have started to use cannabis as one of those tools as well can cannabis be used instead of medication you know what i mean like different medication can they like slowly yeah. get off the medication yeah. and, and start using you know cannabis, cannabis? isn't for everybody just yeah. like prescription pills aren't for everybody or alcohol is not for everybody but a lot of people have been able to lessen their prescription pills and then you know under slowly, a doctor's slowly. guidance eventually eliminate those prescription medications for for pain and for sleep and for nausea and for appetite and for mood um, those can all be replaced with cannabis that's really very promising. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's very nice. And, you know, it can save people's lives because prescription drugs can lead to overdose or to abuse, yeah. you know, and it can also save our government money because if, you know, we're not paying for these high prescription medicines, you know, the Medicare costs can go down. 
Wow, you know, it was so nice having you here. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time. Do you want to add anything? Uh, just that if people want to learn more, go to our websites, um, CA Normal or Orange County Normal or National Normal. That's N-O-R-M-L dot org. Wow. Thank you so much yeah. for coming here. Thank you for watching. And next time we have another interesting guest.